first 12 verses. And this chapter, we will see the straw that broke the camel's back in regard to what caused Israel's leaders to finally murder Jesus. This is the end of the rope. The other shoe has dropped. And in this parable, Jesus condemns those who want to condemn him, which sets the stage for him dying on a cross. This aren't good. When you listen to this parable and its explanation, please consider how God is patient with his people, how loving he is toward all he has made. Don't think so much about the wickedness of the people who killed Jesus and the rejection of his authority in their lives. Consider your own heart and how often you want to go your own way and how each time we disobey what he has told us to do, we too, like those religious leaders, reject his authority in our lives. So this would be, a, this would be one of those, Judy, those toe-stepping sermons. Good. Glasses just broke. <laughs> Let's read. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. What does that parable mean? What is, that, what is all that about? This was the only parable that Jesus spoke in the entire book of Mark. Now, a parable is normally an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's meant to conceal the truth from some and reveal it to others who have ears to hear. But this parable was not about heaven. It was about judgment. Its truth was concealed because Jesus meant it to convict those who heard it. He wanted those religious leaders to know he knew what was up and he wanted them to understand that this plan wasn't secret. Jesus apparently had opened the eyes and ears of those to whom he was speaking because they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. But why? If this parable was directed at the religious leaders, didn't he just come right out and say what he wanted them to understand plainly? Well, because he wanted the people to think deeply about his words and to reflect on what he said. My pastor of over 20 years, Pastor Zach, in the former church I was at, we'd have meetings and, and he would say things to me that weren't exactly clear. And they were thoughtful, he was a man of few words, but he would speak and people would listen to him. And, and I'd go, what? I wouldn't ask him what it meant when he said it. And I'd go and I'd think about it all week. And if I still couldn't figure it out, I'd go ask him, hey, what did you mean when he said this? He goes, well, pray about it. <laughs> and so it's that kind of situation where he would just speak and I would reflect and think. Same thing here. So what did he say exactly that got these guys so furious? They hated Jesus' popularity for one. That was demonstrated when he made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to the massive crowds. 
And they despised his power, which was displayed when he cleansed the temple and up, upset everything that they were used to. Now Jesus tells a parable, a Cliff Notes version essentially of the whole history of Israel, which calls out the religious leaders for the crime they plan to enact against Jesus. In this parable, we'll see the kindness, patience, love, severity, and triumph of God. So let's look at the kindness of God in verse 1. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. In this parable, God is the one who planted this vineyard. The vineyard is Israel, and the farmers are the Jewish leaders. This verse shows the kindness of God toward Israel. Well, how? Well, a vine that was raised in Egypt, transported through the wilderness, and then planted in the promised land where it flourished. God gave this vine, Israel, good land in which to grow under his protection. He gave them his presence. How, wouldn't it be awesome if we actually saw the presence of God? whether a pillar of fire by night or a cloud by day, to know that he's there? Wouldn't that be great that he, they, the visible presence of God was there? He gave them his provision. Their sandals never wore out. There was food every day. Now, I got to admit, I probably grumble if I ate the same thing every day for 40 years. I mean, it's like eating deer sausage every day. You got to think of new ways to eat it, right? But nevertheless, God provided for them for 40 years. And most of all, God gave them his word, his precious word, the word that we have today, the word that we don't feed on enough, right? But he's given it to us. They were his unique and treasured people, Israel was. He did everything he could to make this vine grow and prosper. Yet in Isaiah, he says, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? Nothing more. God did everything for Israel. Sadly, like Charlie Brown and his unrequited love towards the little red-headed girl, Israel never returned her love to God either. So he says also in Isaiah, when I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? In other words, I was so good to Israel, I gave her all of this. And how did they return my love? They gave me bad fruit instead of good fruit. Regardless, as a good farmer, as a faithful husband, God continued to care for his vineyard Israel, to love and to cherish it, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, to show kindness to it, to her. Now, you have to admit, born-again believer, that God has been kind to you, has he not? Has he been kind to you? Or not Israel. But God, at one time, dug you up by the roots and planted you in a good country, did he not? Think about what some of you were and where your life was headed. I am thankful God when I was not even looking for him. He saved me from my wretched ways. And they were wretched. Some of you know my testimony. Joe's sick of hearing it from drug addiction and selling stereos out of the back of my car. And no, I'm not bragging about this at all. But I look back and I think I was headed for nowhere quickly. My whole goal before I was saved was to find out the dark side of life and to live on the edge. And guess what? Within two short years, God granted me that life's goal. And everything came crashing down. But God picked me up. He lifted me up. Then he threw me into another strange country, Texas, which I found is better than the old country, which y'all you know is California. Texas, so much better. <laughs> I'm not doing that to kind of gain extra favor. It's just true. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And the thing is, when you're not saved, you don't know you're in the kingdom of darkness. You don't know it. The enemy has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so that we, they can't understand the truth. God opened our eyes. He gave us life. And we weren't even looking for it, the majority of us. And not only that, not only that, not only are we in the light, we walk in the light now with him, but Casey, it's a great joy and blessing to know where your dad is, isn't it? 
I mean, this is nothing right now. This is just the beginning. This is the starting gate. This is preparation for our eternal home where there's no more pain, no more fear, no more trials, no more tears. I can't wait. But right now, don't you, because of his kindness, want to do all you can for him now? And don't you want to share that blessing with others who don't know? Do you ever think what God has rescued you from, what a gracious, loving God he is, who while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us? When we did not care for him, he reached down and gave us everything and eternity. He gave us everything and eternity. Do you take that for granted? What about the prayers he has answered, the blessings he has given to us, the things he has protected us from, the spouse he has given you, the family, and he loves us eternally. Has God been kind to you, brother and sister? Yes. Boy, that's a really weak affirmation. Has God been kind to you? Yes. Oh, yes and amen. Think about how, God, how kind God is to those who don't know him. He gives them life and breath and food. He gives gifts to those who don't acknowledge him, like Stephen Hawking, who died a year ago. This is what he said. This brilliant man who's considered one of the smartest people who ever lived, this is what he said. He said, I believe the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization that there probably is no heaven and no afterlife either. God sadly did not give this man wisdom. He gave him smarts, but not wisdom. Then the parable of the first verse says, the man who planted this vineyard then rented it out to some farmers and moved away. You all understand that, right? Some of you have land that maybe you can rent out to people and sometimes your landlord may live in another state. That's what happened here. Now let's talk about the patience of God in verses 2 through 5. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. This directly addresses the religious leaders to whom Jesus is speaking. Time and again, these religious leaders led Israel astray. Yet God sent them his servants, sent him his judges and prophets and holy men to bring them back. But what did the leaders do? They beat them, struck them, treated them shamefully, and killed another. Tradition says that Isaiah was sawn in half. Jeremiah was mistreated, thrown into a pit, and tradition says stoned to death by the Jewish leaders. Amos had to run for his life. Zechariah was rejected, and Micaiah was hit in the face. God demonstrated great patience to his people who spurned his direction. Hebrews 11 says there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore, does it? No, it does. God's messengers are still rejected today. That's why we pray for the persecuted church every week. The persecuted church has been on my heart for over 25 years when I was introduced to the man who started Voice of the Martyrs, Richard Wormbrand. More people have been killed in the last century, as I said during prayer, for being a Christian than all previous centuries combined. And 2018 seems to be one of the worst years ever experienced. Here's a Here's an example from the Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, I, it's called, I Commit to Pray, and they send me two or three prayer requests, but they give this testimony. Listen to this. A married couple who started a new church, this is them, in their city had to change venues recently because of persecution. Hani, a former Hindu, and Chakama, a former Muslim, have actively shared their faith ever since coming to Christ and getting married. 
The community where they were living kicked them out because of their bold witness, so they moved to another city. Their church in the new city has grown to more than 55 families, and they have also started two prayer meetings in surrounding villages. Chakama's family continues to threaten her for leaving Islam. Recently, community opposition to their church forced them to relocate, but they have not stopped meeting, and the church continues to grow. That's amazing. That's amazing. And we think, how can we experience this kind of persecution? Well, it's exactly as you shared. I challenge you to talk to one of your religious friends who goes to a denomination in one of the 25 churches in Blanco County. Talk to them about eternity and do they love Jesus. Ask them, do they read their Bible? Ask them what their pastor taught. Why would you do this, to create a fight? No, because you care about them. I remember several years ago in Dripping Springs, I met a man coming out of El Rey Mexican restaurant and I asked him if he was gonna go to heaven or hell. And he said, I'm a, and he named the denomination, he said, I'm a Methodist. I go, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm a Methodist. Well, what does that mean? Is that gonna get you into heaven? He turned around, walked away. Didn't wanna, didn't wanna address that subject. But if we care about, if we love God and we love people, we have to be bold enough to share. However you share, however you do it. Hey, how was that dinner with your neighbors? Oh, shoot. They were sick. Oh, okay. Well, that's legitimate. You know, Mike and Holly, as I visited them on um, Thursday, they have a great gift of hospitality, and they invite all their, all their unbelieving friends and neighbors over. And if you've ever had lunch or dinner with the, with the Blasies, they're just as fun as if going to their marriage class, right? I mean, they're really, you're, they're disarming and fun, and you can just see how God's using them in, in their way to reach these people. I think it's great. I think it's great. So why is God so patient? Why is he patient? Anyone have the answer to that? Come on, why? Because he wants none to perish. Boom, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Boy, he's patient. And we know how his time frame works, right? A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Martin Luther said, I love this, if I were God and the world had treated me as it treated him, I would kick the wretched thing to pieces. I think we could understand what it would sound like in the vernacular. God wants everyone to have a chance to be saved. How has he been patient with you? Now let's talk about the love of God in verses 6 through 8. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Israel had a law that if the land was uninhabited for three years, the tenants of that land could inherit that land. So that's what they were hoping to do. They kill that son so they can inherit the land. The last prophet he sent to Israel was who? Who? Jesus. And look what they did to him. Yet look how much he loved us. He took what man meant for evil to do the greatest good. Look what he did for us. They killed Jesus. How awful. But God had it all in his plan. John 3, 16, everybody, please, in your own version, go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Have you ever thought of the seven wonders of John 3.16? Look at them. For God, the almighty authority, so loved the world, the mightiest motive, that he gave his one and only son the greatest gift that whoever, the widest welcome, believes in him the easiest escape shall not perish the divine deliverance, but have eternal life, the priceless possession. Those are the seven wonders of John 3.16. Those detail explicitly how much God loves us and the world. What type of love is this? Charles Spurgeon says, if you reject him, he answers you with tears. If you wound him, he bleeds out cleansing. If you kill him, he dies to redeem 
If you bury him, he rises again to bring resurrection. Jesus is love made manifest. Amen? Now let's look at the severity of God, verses, verse 9. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. The owner has no choice. The rent's not being paid. What's supposed to be done isn't being done. Hey, even liberal New York does not allow a person to overstay their welcome without paying rent. Take a look at this short video. Parents who took their 30-year-old son to court, their argument, it's time to move out. Gio Benitez on what the judge said tonight. Tonight, a bizarre case of parents versus son. Mark and Christina Rotondo telling a judge through an attorney that their 30-year-old son must move out of their home. They have no obligation to provide support. Uh, he's well over the age of 21. In a lawsuit, they say they have sent him five letters in the past two months like this one. You must leave this house immediately, telling him you have to work, even giving him more than $1,000 to find a new place. There is no uh, reason for these people to have him in their home. Michael says he's planning to leave in a few months. I'm not a burden to them in the home. They don't uh, provide laundry or food. Uh, it's, it's really a moot point. Uh, for them to seek me to be ejected. The judge, in the end, siding with the parents. It sounded like you said you need to vacate today. It sounded kind of like that, too, but that's just so ridiculous. And, David, tonight Michael says he has his own web business and plans to appeal, but it did not go unnoticed that when he left the courthouse today, he went right back to his parents' house. David, we'll see how long that lasts. Gio, thank you. Oh, man. Parents, uh, you get the point. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to other. There are consequences for those who test God's patience. He sent John the Baptist as a forerunner of Jesus. He was ignored and then beheaded. God sends his son as the final messenger. Though he taught with authority and demonstrated who he was by signs and miracles, he's still ultimately rejected. So God rejects those who reject his son. The religious leaders refused grace and love, so now nothing is left but awful judgment. You all know what the unforgivable sin is, right? Do you? What's the unforgivable sin? Rejecting Christ. That's it. There is no other sin... When you reject the Holy Spirit, you have rejected your only way out to be forgiven through Jesus Christ. The religious leaders refuse God's grace and love, so now nothing is left but his judgment. They must now face God's wrath. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Do you understand that? That we are born as children of wrath? Because of our sin, we are born into this world sinners. And God's wrath is on us, plain and simple. You live your whole life with his wrath on you and you don't even know it. So when we tell an unbeliever that they're standing before God is hell, they get mad. Why do you think they get mad? Well, let's look at the spiritual aspect. Because for one thing, Satan doesn't want you to be telling that person that, right? And so if he can get angry at you and cause you go, oh, hey, I'm sorry, and run away, instead of standing firm and telling them the truth because you love them, then God can open their heart. God can open their heart. So when you tell them they're children of wrath, you've got to also bring about how God so loved them as well. He loved them by sending his son. But how many people do you think in the world understand they're children of wrath? No, they all think they're right with the big guy, right? The man upstairs. They wear t-shirts that say, Jesus is my homeboy. I hate those shirts. Jesus is not my homeboy. He's my Lord and my Savior. But it's our responsibility. It's our, responsi it's our responsibility to tell them that. They're children of wrath. God's wrath remains on him. But when they believe in Jesus, guess what happens to that wrath? The wrath is transferred to Jesus. The wrath has already been transferred to Jesus, but they just have to appropriate that grace and forgiveness by believing. Nothing has changed. All those who reject God's messengers. By the way, who are those messengers? 
Us. All those who do not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will face his terrible wrath. We love John 3.16. We recite John 3.16. We teach our kids John 3.16, but I do believe we do everyone a great disservice when we don't remind them what John 3.18 says. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So an unsaved person right now has two things about them. God's wrath is on them, and they are condemned already. An unsaved person is like a a person on death row waiting for the sentence to be carried out. When is that sentence carried out? On the day they die. Do you think we have a great responsibility to say this? Oh my gosh, we do, because they don't know it. They don't know it because they're good Methodists and people and Presbyterians and Community Church of the Hills members. Let's not leave us out because I don't know if everyone in here is saved, but today you're hearing it. Today you're hearing if you're not a Christian, if you're not born again, if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, you're a child of wrath, you're condemned already, you die by hitting a deer on the way home, we never see again, not even in heaven. So please... It was, it, was, it was John's wish that the gospel was preached at the memorial service so people could be saved. And only one person out of that crowd of 500 people came forward. Please, please think about this. Please think about this. Where will you go when you die? Romans 11.22 says, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. We've already talked about his kindness and his love and his patience, right? He's given you so much. But then there's sternness, and the sternness is his wrath. That will happen if you don't turn to Jesus. If not today, soon. If you want to know further, I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you a good... We'll go to the crab shack or the, the boil shack, and we'll look at those things being boiled and say, now, do you want that to be you? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, I won't say that. We'll, eat, we'll eat, eat those. Ultimately, there's the triumph of God. The parable of the vineyard is done. Now Jesus talks about a building. The last verses. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. A good foundation begins with a perfectly straight cornerstone, right, Mike? That way the building will be built correctly. You know, there's this house going down the spur right right before the high school. Have you ever seen that house? It's like three stories. It's about two feet wide. And I swear, if a big bad wolf came and blew on that thing... I don't know if it had a strong foundation, but it looks like it's... Joe, what is that house, anyway? (laughs) It used to be the drive-in move? When you were a kid, that was like, what, 110 years ago? What? (laughs) Really? Oh, so is that a house occupied now? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Well, that's the point, though, right? We want to build our house, our spiritual house, on a solid foundation. By the way, I'm 60, so I can joke about being an old guy now, okay? The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus because he didn't have the right credentials, the right lineage, the right education, and they killed him. But God got the glory as this was part of his perfect plan. It was God who set that cornerstone to be the rock that everyone should build their lives upon. It was God who raised Jesus from the dead after the Jewish leaders rejected his one and only son. Though the leaders understood the parable, they did not act on it. They rejected Jesus yet again and hardened their hearts. So the same applies to everyone in here today. You now have heard very clearly everything you need to know to get saved. If you walk out of here unsaved, it isn't because I gave it my best shot. And it ain't because anybody else's fault. It's you to make the choice. I beg you, if you're 
a church goer, but you haven't given your life to Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Because you don't know. I got to tell you, you know, um, after the memorial service, which was probably the best memorial service, if you could say, I've ever gone to because of the testimonies of this man's life. He left behind a testimony of faithfulness and friendship. It was said of this man, John, that he was a friend to everyone, and I want to be a friend to everyone for the sake of the gospel. And I say to you, please consider the words that you've heard today because these are Jesus' words. These are Jesus' words. The last verse says, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. May we be mindful of how we treat our Savior. May we listen to his leadings and never, ever forget how patient he has been with us, how kind, how loving. Amen? Let's pray. I want to ask those of you to join Casey and I up here if you need to be prayed for, anointed with oil, as we sing this last song. Please take advantage of this time now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's so clear and it's so simple and yet so difficult. The only way anyone gets saved is because of your Holy Spirit changing that heart, granting us repentance so that we may trust in you. May that be the case today with everyone in here, that no one leaves today without knowing for sure that they are saved. And it's as simple as a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I know that I have sinned against you. I have rebelled against your word. But I trust you now, and I want to believe you. And I do believe you that you died for my sins. You were buried, and on the third day rose again. I pray that everyone in here would pray that. But now comes the hard part, living it out, working out their salvation with fear and trembling to be educated in the word to be discipled to understand how to go and make disciples but this is only your works so I'll entrust you to do what you need to do Lord amen please come forward now and get